Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, symposium. And it's uh, my real pleasure to uh, co-chair this uh, symposium with uh, Nicolas van Meegem that you all know. And uh, we will have, uh, we'll be helped by two experience operators uh, clearly familiar with the Sentinel cerebral protection device, Dan Blackman from the UK and Sam Dawkins for the time being from the US. <laughs> okay. So uh, you see that it's a quite a small room and it's good because it's quite uh, cozy and it meant, it's meant to uh, promote a lot of interaction. So uh, please, we have microphones in the room. You may have comments because it's not so frequent to use cerebral protection devices and we will try to convince you at the end of the symposium that it should be routine practice for all our patients uh, because we, we will see if we have evidences, evidences or other aspects of the procedure that promote the use of cerebral protection. So I will strongly encourage you to use the microphones. Any kinds of comments, thoughts, criticism is welcome. Uh, at the end of the symposium, we, we hope that you go back back home with enough information uh, to safely use Claret Sentinel, Boston Sentinel device now in your TAVI procedures. So having said that, first words to uh, Nicolas van Meegem to introduce the session. Thank you, Didier. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I think there has been a lot of talk about the need for cerebral embolic protection in uh, contemporary transcatheter aortic valve implantation because a lot of the uh, experts uh, suggest that, well, you know, over time we've seen a reduction in neurological events um, with TAVI, but the question is, is that A, is that a reality, is that true, and, and two, is it just about clinically significant neurological events or is there something more to it. Uh, I think uh, over time what we've seen in, uh, the, in several registries, among others the TVT registry, but also in a combined registry of Toulouse and Rotterdam and Milano, we see that we are getting better in uh, executing TAVI. And this is illustrated by a reduction in mortality, a reduction in vascular complications, and reduction in bleeding complications, but no reduction in neurological events. And this is an important notion. So in, in current clinical practice, in principle, you don't see that the neurological event rate is, is, going, is becoming zero. It's still there. But at the meantime, we are moving and shifting to lower risk patients. Earlier today, Professor Colombo in a previous session had a very remarkable statement and he said, okay, we are always talking about we move, the TAVI space is moving to lower risk patients and there we might consider cerebral embolic protection. But okay, so if stroke happens in an octogenarian, that doesn't matter. So why would we not protect uh, patients who are older and only serve this technology for younger patients? And I think he made a strong statement that uh, if we have a technology that is able to do what it uh, promises to do, being capturing debris and taking it out of the, of the body and preventing it from reaching the brain, why would we not use it? Well, the, the people who are against the use of cerebral embolic protection would claim that, okay, but we see the neurological event rate is relatively low, and in the randomized trials with, uh, with these devices, we haven't seen a significant reduction. Okay, that is, uh, that is a potential answer, but if you, do a, if you realize that these trials were not powered for clinical events and you do a meta-analysis of all the trials, you will see that there is a significant reduction in events. And uh, during this session, we have uh, two presentations on the European experience and the US experience that illustrate that the use of cerebral embolic protection in contemporary practice does make a difference. Other people will say, yeah, but that is an additional maneuver that we need to do during the procedure. It will come with more radiation, with more contrast. It's a burden for the procedure. Um, well, that remains to be seen. I'm uh, definitely a proponent of the minimalist or the simplified uh, TAVI approach. I think uh, Didier is also uh, um, a proponent of that approach. And in my opinion, specifically in patient in the minimalist approach, uh, cerebral embolic protection is a key component. So without further ado, I would like to uh, ask Dan Blackman to give his uh, sentiments on the role of the Sentinel in minimalist TAVI. Dan. Thanks, Nicholas Didier. So it's great to see a good audience even at this stage of the conference and I think that speaks to the interest and the importance of cerebral embolic protection technology and stroke, which I think most operators will agree is, that is now the thing that has by far the biggest adverse impact on their programme. 
So my job is to talk about the role of Sentinel in minimalist TAVI procedures. These are my disclosures. So I would combine the concept of minimalist with the concept of fast track. We don't just want a procedure that we can do simply, uh, easily, with minimal uh, invasiveness and minimal morbidity. We also want to be want a fast track approach. This means getting the patient through the procedure quickly and out of the hospital quickly. And it's really essential to deliver this, not just for the well-being of the patients, but also so we can manage the expansion and this transformative te te technology that TAVI represents. So I would uh, describe minimalist or fast track TAVI as TAVI performed under local anesthesia, not conscious sedation, but either no or minimal sedation, ideally nurse delivered, in my opinion, fully percutaneous, lines out, preferably the end of the procedure. Patient can then go back to a regular ward, not the intensive care or coronary care unit, be rapidly mobilized, sitting out at four hours, uh, moving the same day, and discharge as soon as possible, either day one or perhaps day two, uh, depending on conduction issues. So this is TAVI that's like PCI, not like CABG. And the question is, how does sentinel cerebral protection fit with this approach? Well, as Nicholas has already said, we know that the incidence of stroke remains important. This is a whole collection of trials, and they all show stroke rates around about the 5% mark. And there are two important points to, to, to add to this. The first, as Nicholas has just said, is this, this rate of stroke has not really fallen. We've seen mortality coming from around 10%, even 15 in the very early studies to 1.5%. Paravalvular leak is more or less solved. Pacemaker rates have fallen, even vascular complication rates. But stroke rates are essentially unchanged. The second important point is this is almost certainly an underestimate of the true instance of stroke. If you take any trial which has proper neurologist adjudication with examination before and after the TAVI procedure, you then start to see stroke rates of at least 10%. The second thing is the effect of stroke. So here we see just one piece of evidence demonstrating that stroke has a major impact on mortality, a fourfold increase in this study. But it's not just mortality, it's also clearly morbidity, and it's cost, hospital stay, and logistics of the procedure. These are TVT data. It's hard to read, so I've picked out the salient points showing that mortality was increased by nearly threefold. Stroke added seven days to the hospital stay, made it twice as likely the patient would not go to their own home on discharge, and a 40% increase of hospital costs. And this is not just disabling stroke, this is any stroke, where even minor neurological symptoms will lead to continued hospitalization for further imaging and, uh, and observation. So what about the Sentinel Cerebral Protection System? Well, many of you will be familiar with it, but this is the device you can see here. It's a double filter approach in the anominate and left common carotid arteries. And importantly, it's a six French radial sheath. We know that's minimally invasive, and it's deployed over a standard 014 PCI guide wire that we're all familiar with. The key uh, single randomized control trial was the Sentinel trial, which led to FDA approval of this device, and the primary endpoint was not met, as Nicholas has alluded to, and that was the new MRI lesion volume in protected territories. You can see it was reduced by 40%, but that this didn't reach statistical significance. However, in a meta-analysis, when combined with the other two main Sentinel studies, the Mistral C from Nicholas's institution in Rotterdam and Clean Tavi from Leipzig, combining these studies, we see that there was a significant reduction in MRI lesion volume. But more importantly, what we care about is stroke. And these are the data from the Sentinel trial looking at periprocedural stroke, which is what cerebral embolic protection aims to impact on. And you can see a 63% reduction in uh, stroke within 72 hours. Not quite statistically significant, but as Nicholas has said, the trial was not powered for clinical endpoints, but in a relatively small trial was very close to demonstrating this, and the absolute effect was impressive. If we combine those data again with other studies, this time also adding in studies of other embolic protection devices, the TriGuard and Umbrella, you can see uh, here that there was an overall significant reduction in death or stroke. So what about the logistics? That's my remit to talk about how it impacts on the procedure. Is it going to add time? Is it going to add complexity? Is it going to add morbidity? Well, I'm showing here data from the Sentinel trial combined with Clean Tav in the Ulm Single Center Registry. In procedural success, you can see we're around 95%. Fluoro time, we have one minute of extra fluoro time. Procedure time reported from Sentinel was prolonged by nine minutes. 
and in Sentinel, the median deployment time was four minutes. But it's worth commenting that in the Sentinel trial, there were two or three roll-in cases. So these were centres that were brand new to this technology. And we do not, uh, in Leeds, use this in every case. So we, we can a testament to the fact that this is a device that's pretty easy to pick up and the learning curve is fairly short. And we'll see from Nicholas and Sam how it performs in experienced hands. Contrast dose, not changed. What about morbidity? These are the data from Sentinel on complications. You'll see at the bottom there was one uh, Sentinel-related complications. This was a brachial artery false aneurysm in a case where their radial access was unsuccessful. And if you look at the top line that I've also highlighted, you'll see that the primary safety endpoint of major adverse cerebral and cardiovascular events was actually seen less frequently numerically and certainly not different statistically to the control group. So it's a six French radial approach, and as expected, it adds no morbidity. So we can summarize that as saying we have 95% procedural success, a four minute medium deployment time in inexperienced hands, and 91%, this is all from the Sentinel trial in under 10 minutes, device related complications in fewer than 1% of patients. What do we do in Leeds? Well, our minimalist approach is to have nurse led sedation um, with tiny doses of fentanyl and intravenous paracetamol. The vast majority performed percutaneously. We performed four cases in a single lab with a kind of 8.30 to 5.30, not a long working day. A current median discharge day is day two. Uh, more patients than ever going home on day one. We use Sentinel in selected cases. This is primarily due to cost uh, factors. However, we have identified Probably the only reasonable, consistent predictive factor from registry and trial data is previous stroke or TIA, or in Sentinel it was baseline MRI lesion volume before the procedure. We also use it in patients in significant cognitive impairment in whom we would want to avoid any further decline, and niche cases like intracardiac thrombus or severe or mobile arch atheroma. We have found that Sentinel has no impact on minimalist approach. If we're doing one, two, three, or four Sentinel cases in our four list day, it won't impact on our strategy. So I'd conclude, ladies and gentlemen, that stroke is a catastrophic complication for the patient. I think we can all agree on that. And even when non-disabling has major impact on, proceed on hospital stay and on quality of life. Sentinel cerebral protection, importantly, is fast, it's straightforward, it's predictable, and has minimal morbidity. It's entirely compatible with minimalist or fast-track TAVI. Stroke, however, is clearly not compatible with minimalist or fast-track TAVI. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> So thank you very much, Dan, for this very comprehensive and thorough uh, analysis of the uh, uh, integration of the Sentinel in a minimalist uh, TAVI approach. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? While you are thinking about potential questions, I have one for you. Uh, there, if you want to integrate the Sentinel in your daily practice, you may have to modify some aspects of the preparation of the patient. For example, the time of the administration of the anticoagulation, the vascular accesses that you are going to use. Uh, would you mind making it clearer uh, for the audience the sequence that you use in your own institution? Yeah, so I mean, we would normally start with uh, radial access. In our institution we perform bilateral femoral arterial punctures um, and so we, we, we put a small sheath in one side, we cross over, um, we implant using the pigtail to, for, for, for putting the big sheath in and then we put a V18 protective wire down the other leg. Um, and then we would take the initial aortogram, um, both to look at the uh, coplanar view for valve implantation and then an arch aortogram to look at the great vessels. You can skip that because the CT will show the great vessels very nicely, but we normally perform that unless there's an issue over renal function. And then we will deploy the, um, the claret device after we've taken that image. Obviously, we want to get the claret sentinel device in before we've started to instrument the aorta or the valve in particular. Now, you asked about anticoagulation. I mean, think you could argue that if you put the radial sheath in first, then there may be a minor delay in heparinization. We normally still heparinize after we put the large sheath in and not before that, just in case there are any issues with large sheath implantation. But I think that delay is acceptable. It's no different to the delay we sometimes encounter with heparinizing for the radial artery um, in diagnostic angiography and PCI. Have you changed your anticoagulation protocol? 
Yeah, uh, that was uh, more or less the sense of my que uh, question, because in Toulouse what we do, uh, before we uh, integrate the Sentinel, we used to provide all the patients with 3,000 units of heparin, whatever the, the weight is, and we tried to go fast, flush, regularly flush the shifts, and uh, with the Sentinel, uh, you should provide heparin before to make sure that you have a decent ACT, 250 or slightly above, to prevent all the uh, thrombus, potential thrombus related to the device place placement. So it's, uh, it has slightly changed our practice, but we didn't see any vascular bleeding complication because this is what we fear. If we have any failure at the level of the femoral large bore shift access site, uh, having provided the patient with heparin might generate some bleeding. But in fact, we didn't experience that at all. And I have to say that, thanks to my friend Nicolas, we've moved to the eco-guided puncture for the femoral, and it added safety to the vascular access. So it nicely combines uh, both things, getting the radial access, providing full dose of heparin to the patient, deploying the claret, and as you said, going for the a large bore shift uh, insertion and then uh, uh, working across the aortic arch. So to our, uh, in our experience, it perfectly integrates itself in a minimalist approach, uh, but we, have, you know, we slightly changed our sequence. Well, I mean, we deploy the claret after the large sheath goes in, so they are heparinized before the claret goes in. Yeah, so we, so we also have a little bit of a modification to that theme. We, we first get all the accesses. So the right radial axis and then ultrasound guided femoral axis. Then we, uh, then we give, once we have comp uh, full access with six French sheets, we give full heparin, full dose heparin. Then we deploy the claret. And then we proceed with the large uh, bore sheet because often we use a stiffer wire to introduce the, the large bore catheter. And we typically then have that stiff wire already in the ascending aorta. And okay, if the moment you are starting to, to manipulate and navigate wires across the aortic arch, the patient is at risk for, uh, for embolization of atherosclerotic debris from the arch itself. So this is, this is our sequence. I must also admit that since we are... Uh, since we have been uh, working under uh, local anesthesia, uh, procedure time, overall procedure time, is 45 minutes in general. And uh, the moment that all the catheters are in, we are more or less 10 minutes in the procedure. So by the time that we do our ACT check, we're already closing. So basically it's, it's um, yeah. Uh, we often encounter then that when we check the ACT before our closure, that the ACT already has dropped below 250. Yeah. So I have an another question for you, uh, Dan. Uh, so most uh, often, quite frequently, one of the argument, uh, one of the general thought uh, concerning the Sentinel device, it's that it's going to uh, provide additional contrast, require additional contrast during the procedure first to deploy it and to identify the location of the, uh, the cerebral vessels. So uh, have you integrated in your practice a pre-planning with the CT scan because all the patients undergo a CT scan assessment before the procedure. So have you focused more on the uh, distribution of the cerebral vessels and trying to avoid that potentially additional uh, load of dye during the procedure? Yes, I mean, if we're, if we're planning on using cerebral protection, then we will look at the great head and neck vessels. But the, the, the routine TAVI CT will always include the head and neck vessels. Um, so you, you will always see those very clearly. And I think that is an important element, uh, element of it. Uh, you can identify difficult anatomy. There is some difficult anatomy, but the device, you know, in our experience, and it's relatively low volume experience compared to the panel, um, it will still be remarkably effective in um, getting around difficult anatomy. The most common thing that we see is a very tortuous and nominate artery, um, but it is pretty effective at getting around that. We always use a relatively uh, stiff PCI wire, like a PT Choice Extra Support, mm -hmm. and that will take it around that kind of tortuous and nominate. So we still perform the arch aortogram because it can give us some landmarks to perform you know, during the procedure. Um, and if renal function isn't an issue. If renal function is an issue, then we will we'll cut that out and just use the CT. Yeah. Do you do an aortogram for the Not arch? anymore, not anymore. 
At the start of our experience, we used to do it for every single patient because it provided us with more understanding about the way to deploy the device, where to land it. But after a couple of cases, you clearly can estimate everything with the CT scans. So we don't do it anymore, and it doesn't uh, generate more time for the procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we also don't use uh, an additional uh, contrast aortogram. We rely on the simulation that we make based on our MSCT scan, and we simulate then in an LAO30 project so that you can clearly see the bifurcations. And as an additional landmark, we have the pigtail catheter uh, in the aortic arch. So it's, it's uh, located in the aortic arch. So Sam, you are, you're part now of a, of a busy program in LA. Um, you're, you're still in training, you're mm -hmm. a fellow there. So are you also, as a fellow, being trained in uh, getting the technology in or getting the de deployment of the Sentinel? Yeah, yeah. We, um, we use the Sentinel for pretty much every case uh, where it's technically possible and the fellows would be expected to, to deploy it from start to finish. And just to your previous point, we have, we also have a CT to help with our planning um, so you don't need to do a contrast injection. And if you do need to do a contrast injection, it doesn't need to be a power injection. It really can be three, three cc's of contrast just to show you where the ostium of the left common carotid is. So you don't need to do a aortogram with 20 cc's of dye. And you're an experienced uh, radialist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, um, we'll talk about this in uh, my talk, but the, the tricks that radial angiographers and PCI operators have, a lot of those tricks work with the Sentinel as well. So while you may see a CT scan that shows a very tortuous brachiocephalic uh, in most patients, just getting the patient to take a deep breath, sometimes a bit of back tension on the coronary guide wire as you advance the device. In most patients, that's enough to deliver the uh, Sentinel device. So the tricks you use for radial PCI are uh, effective here too. And I think that is m maybe one of the caveats that we are facing with uh, programs where there are also surgeons heavily involved in uh, doing transfemoral TAVI. Uh, if they are not experienced with getting radial access, as we are with our coronary work, that might be a theoretical problem. So I do believe that you need radial training on how to get radial access uh, when you want to use this uh, in a systematic way. Would you agree, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was. I wanted to ask um, Sam and, and you, Nicholas, actually, uh, on that point. If you can't go radial, will you go brachial? Will you go ulna? Um, I guess you don't want to fail radial and then go ulna. But what's your approach? So, um, our our pragmatic approach is firstly the sort of sequence is we get the radial access, then we open the device, and while we're uh, prepping the device, we get the femoral access. So that, that's, that's how we do it. Um, it is possible to do ulna, not after you've just failed the radial. Um, if we have any anxiety about uh, the radial or the ulna, we'll, we can obviously check them with an ultrasound, make sure they're patent. Um, you can do it brachial with a cut down, um, but that's not our, not our practice. Yeah, we, we, do, we don't move to a brachial approach. We do um, relatively frequent ulnar uh, access, but not brachial because there is a, there is a hemostasis issue after the, after the procedure. So when you take away, so we, we are all familiar with these uh, radial bands at the end of the procedure for after radial access. That works very effectively, but for the brachial uh, approach, we don't have that. And um, we have a couple of uh, brachial bleedings with uh, coronary interventions through a brachial access, and I don't want to experience that with our, uh, <laughs> with our, with our uh, Sentinel. And in the post-procedure period, everyone is focused on the legs, they're not focused on the arms, no, no. so to leave someone with a brachial, brachial yeah. stick is uh, yeah. worrying. One final question, do you reverse aparin at the, at the end of the procedure, in all your cases? Um, no. It, will dep it, it depends a little bit on what closure device we're using and what kind of closure we've got at the end. So we don't, if we use Proglide, then we don't like to reverse the heparin until we know, we've done a final angiogram and we've shown hemostasis. And if that final angiogram shows hemostasis, then we don't, need, we don't feel we need protamine, so we don't give protamine. Yeah. Well, if we use the Manta device, then we ut routinely use protamine, because I think a reversal of the heparin is an important part of the efficacy of the Manta. So it really depends on that. I don't think, it, for me, a radial puncture, it doesn't make a difference. You don't need to reverse the, the protamine for a six French radial sheath. I'm always a little bit concerned with the, the protamine use because we don't really know what, what is going to happen in terms of uh, a thrombotic cascade and uh, thrombus is one of the components of stroke and so I'm always um, really concerned and conservative and I try not to provide protamine to the patient. I, it's only empirical but it's just a way to add 
small elements to decrease at the end of the day the risk of stroke for the patient. Sentinel at first and then at the end, as we are so secure now in terms of uh, achieving a good hemostasis at the level of the femoral, we don't provide a protamine. I think it's a good point. I think the other point is, in general, for vascular complications, you can usually fix bleeding, but you can't always fix thrombus. Yeah. You know, that's been our experience. Nice. Okay, that was a very nice uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Dan. And so let's move on to Nicolas for a European experience. So that was, a, that was a very good discussion. Thank you, Dan. Um, so now a little word on the real-world European experience of cerebral protection. And I think here we were somewhat pioneering in Europe. And in that, time, in that day and age, it was still possible to have uh, novel technology in Europe. Now it's getting more and more difficult. Uh, but uh, this is uh, to set the stage, uh, the stroke diagnosis by MSCT after TAVI in our center. And you see that the majority of the strokes were cortical infarcts. And if you combine the cortical infarcts with the undetermined infarcts, then probably that is what you, uh, is explained by embolic stroke. So lacunar infarcts is a different kind of stroke. Hemorrhagic infarcts, of course, is not related uh, to um, embolization. And we know that um, within 24 hours, probably the stroke uh, pathophysiology relates to embolic events that can be either thrombotic material or uh, debris that is embolizing and going en, en route to the brain. There are also lacunar infarcts that is possible, but it, it is a minor minority based on the CT scanning that I showed you before. And that probably can be due to RV pacing, for instance, and relative uh, uh, low uh, hemodynamic pressures during those uh, pacing events. After 24 to 48 hours, the, there's a little shift in pathophysiology, and there, are, there is some data that especially new onset atrial fibrillation is associated with stroke rate between 48 and, uh, hours and 30 days. And after 30 days, it is the conventional risk factors for stroke that apply, like embolic uh, events due to atrial fibrillation and atherosclerosis as a cause of uh, lacunar infarcts. This is what we're facing when we are implanting a, a valve in the aortic space. So we have to go through uh, the arterial tree that often is also diseased in patients with aortic stenosis. So what you might, might encounter, is, encounter is very calcified and atherosclerotic disease in the aortic arch. And of course, you will face a degenerated valve. But also, you're using uh, material, foreign body material. And also there, there is material that can uh, be scraped of the delivery system and also then travel to the brain. So the question always is, and that is the question that I had when I started using the device, so what in hell are we catching then? Is it, is it thrombus? Is it uh, pieces of the valve? So what is it? And this, was, um, this resulted in our publication in circulation in 2013. So what we did when we started using these filters, uh, of course we were looking macroscopically whether there was debris, but also we sent all the filters to our pathologist from day one everything went to the pathologist and then we collaborated also with Renu Vermani who is an authority in the field and then we were wondering okay so what's going to happen what, what will we find well in 75% of the patients there was debris in the filters there was debris stemming from the aortic wall or the aortic valve there was also a lot of thrombus found we did see at that point in time all our patients were under general anesthesia. We had some ACT issues. So the ACT was below 250 in almost all patients at that time. So we modified our ACT protocol uh, in 2013 because of these data. But also there was other uh, tissue to be found in, uh, in our filters. Now we have three randomized trials exploring the use of cerebral embolic protection with the, with the Sentinel filter, uh, looking into MRIs before and after the the procedure. Unfortunately, all trials were, um, sorry, we have to go back. So all trials were somewhat underpowered, probably also because um, in the majority of these trials, well, in all three trials, there was at least a 20% dropout rate in the MRI follow-up. And that is due to the fact that we are talking about octogenarians, so 80-year-olds or older. And those patients, they are not so happy when they have to undergo two MRIs within five days. I mean, how would you, how would you be, right? So you first get an MRI, then you get your valve treated, and within three days, there is another MRI to be done. So there was, in, for instance, in Rotterdam, there was a 42% dropout rate, and of course, that 
affects the trial results. And eventually, in all the trials, we lacked statistical significance uh, in our primary endpoint. What is the EMC uh, experience uh, if we look at the protected patients and compare them to the unprotected patients? I have to say that since 2013 in Rotterdam, when we can use the filters, we will use the filters. Uh, so there are some reasons why we will not use it. It's in 15 to 20 percent of the patients. There are anat anatomical issues why we cannot use the filters. For instance, if the landing zone is too large to accommodate the filters or too small, or if there is too much atherosclerotic disease in the landing zone, we would, we would refrain uh, uh, from a sentinel embolic protection. But if you now look at the patients, we had uh, almost 300 patients with embolic protection and 450 without embolic protection. They are not balanced, so there is some kind of a difference between the two, the, between the two cohorts. But still, if you just look at the, at the numerical outcome, then we saw an absolute reduction in, of 4% in neurological events. So you would need to treat 20, 25 patients uh, 25 patients to save one neurological event. And we're not talking about uh, the, the, the minor strokes. No, no, it were really the major strokes that are clinically significant. There was a significant difference in Rotterdam. We also then looked into the data and combined the data of Rotterdam and Groningen. That's another university hospital that had shown some interest in the use of sentinel embolic protection. We increased our patient number to over a thousand patients and we compared again the patients with and without uh, embolic protection and uh, we ended up with 485 patients with uh, sentinel protection and 589 without protection and basically the numbers were strikingly similar and the events the event rate was more or less similar in Groningen and in Rotterdam and when we combined we also we again found a 4% absolute reduction in neurological event rate. Ulm has the credit for the first presentation of their uh, clinical data using a, a claret embo or sentinel embolic protection. And again, they find a almost 4% absolute reduction in all day stro in stroke rate at seven days. And if they combine stroke and mortality, they again find a 70% reduction from 6.8% to 2.1% in the protected patients. The issue is that those trials were not randomized. It's retrospective studies, so there you, you have to be careful not to overemphasize. But still, I do believe that the numerical data that you can see is uh, quite striking. Uh, what we tip, what we now currently have as technology is filter-based protection with a filter in the brachiocephalic trunk and one in the left common carotid. So three out of four arteries that go to the brain are being protected. That uh, generated my thinking, and I, st I thought, okay, if we would introduce an additional filter in the left vertebral, would that make a difference? Well, as I mentioned, MRI before and after was a difficult thing to do, but it was not difficult for me to put in an additional filter and then also send that, that filter to pathology. We did that in 11 patients, and strikingly, we did find embolic debris in all the filters, so both in the sentinel filter, but also in the left vertebral filter, and the size of the debris was quite similar in both um, in, in both filters, so in the sentinel filter and in the left vertebral filter. Strikingly also, it's not only uh, tissue coming from the aortic valve or atherosclerotic uh, tissue, it is also myocardial tissue. One in three of the patients had myocardial tissue in the filters that was en route to, en route to the brain, probably due to the manipulation of the wire in the left ventricle as we are uh, advancing our uh, catheters. These were the claret milestones, and we no longer talk about claret, it's now Boston scientific, but if you see in what a short time frame uh, this, um, this technology has been uh, developed and has been adopted in our practice. So we had a first in men uh, publication in March 2012, then we had the histopathology paper in circulation in 2013, 2016 saw the uh, publication of the randomized trials, and now in July 2018 Boston Scientific has acquired uh, Claret. So in conclusion, I think protected TAVI is intuitive. These filters will catch debris in all your TAVI patients. The European experience is consistent. Embolic protection will also reduce uh, neurological events. And in my practice, 80% of all TAVI cases will, uh, are protected cases because protected TAVI works. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. This was a brilliant uh, overview of the uh, technology and the adoption in a high volume center. Uh, I may have a quick question for, for you. Uh, we know that stroke is mainly uh, periprocedural within the first two or three days, and, but the uh, system, the cerebral protection device, only protects the brain during the procedure. So we have a couple of, a certain number of strokes occurring between the, in the time frame between the, the, the end of the procedure and day two, for example. What do you think is the physiopathology? What is the reason to your opinion? Yeah, so the moment um, debris or thrombotic material is embolizing to the brain, at one point it will get stuck in the small vessels. But that doesn't mean that it completely obstructs the vessel. So it may, take, it may slow down the flow in that particular small vessel. And at one point, it will activate the thrombotic cascade. And then eventually, it will occlude the vessel. So my belief, and I think Samir Kapadia was the first one to, uh, to come up with that hypothesis, uh, is that what is happening with these um, strokes up to 72 hours. Nicholas, it was interesting, um, your 11 patients with a device in the, uh, protecting the left vertebral as well, but for me, I guess, you know, the, 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 key, the key benefit of the Sentinel compared to other embolic protection devices that I've had exposure to is the simplicity. And if it's going to penetrate into routine clinical care, I think that's what's got to be preserved, something that, you know, is simple, doesn't add much time, doesn't add much complexity. Do you think that you're just, you know, that extra device from the left radial, that extra procedural time is just going to tip the balance away from um, its routine use in clinical care, or do you think there is going to be a place for that approach? Well, I do believe that at the end of the day, complete protection is the way to go. And there are some prototypes uh, being developed, and they're very close to uh, first-in-man use with filter-based protection. I think the, the additional benefits you've, you're, we are having with uh, filter-based protection in its current generation versus the other devices is its radial approach, its six French, and it's very and you capture debris. So you capture the debris, and you can remove the debris from the body with embolic deflectors. The debris remains in the body. It goes to wherever it can go. So probably it will end up in the kidneys or in the small vessels of the leg and may affect um, uh, cir the circulation there. But also these devices at this moment in time with their femoral approach have a, too high, uh, have a large profile. They are um, nine French and higher. Okay. So I think what we're going to do is to move to Sam yeah. for his... Uh is the overview of a, a U.S. center large volume experience, and then we have a common uh, combined discussion on your, both your lectures. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to present uh, the experience from Cedar sinai on behalf of uh, Raj Makar and the team there. Uh, despite all the advances we've seen in transcatheter valves, all the advances we've seen in the uh, techniques we use to deploy them, the risk of stroke remains a concern. Uh, in contemporary trials, as uh, Dan showed, the risk of stroke persists at about 5%. Uh, stroke, I think, for physicians and patients alike, is our most feared complication. And anyone who's had a post-TAVI stroke has increased mor mortality, increased length of stay, and the cost of, cost of hospital admission is much higher. The Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device uh, is a device with two filters. The proximal filter sits in the brachiocephalic trunk. The distal filter is positioned in the left common carotid artery. And as the image on the right shows, that covers 90% of the cerebral circulation. Mm. Here's a short demonstration of the device being deployed. A coronary guide wire with the device on it is advanced into the ascending aorta. The proximal filter is deployed. The device is flexed. And the tip of the device is directed towards the left common carotid. The coronary guide wire is advanced into the left common carotid followed by the filter. <clears throat> so this is the filter going into the left common carotid. 
and that's where the device sits. And although it's not necessary, you can do uh, an angiogram to prove uh, the inadequate position of the device. From a practical perspective, at that point, what we do is we stick the device to the uh, table, and then we cover it up with a drape. And that means you can then carry on with the tab, and nothing gets in the way. Um, the device is safe and protected, and you're not going to pull it. As another point, which hasn't yet come up, um, it's uh, the device doesn't interact either with the valve or if you're doing coronary protection and you have enough access, you can do sentinel and coronary protection at the same time without any issue. Um, th this is some debris we've, we uh, have seen at Cedar sinai In pretty much every case, there is visible debris in the filters. Mm. In June of 2017, the FDA cleared the Sentinel device for use during TAVA, and at that point, we decided that uh, cerebral protection should be the standard of care at Cedar sinai uh, we have a core lab that uh, analyzes all our CTs, and we just added an extra image to their data set, which is an uh, image of the aortic arch uh, in a suitable view. Generally, it's LAO 20 to 30, uh, and that allows us to plan the procedure and determine whether uh, cerebral protection with this device is possible. So since FDA approval, we have uh, done, in that year, we did 618 TAVIs. Um, we attempted uh, sentinel cerebral protection in 484 patients, and it was used in 456. The stroke rate at seven days was the endpoint we were looking at. This is a breakdown of the valve type by the two groups, the sentinel arm and the no sentinel arm. And this is just to illustrate the point that uh, the valve type isn't a consideration for us when using sentinel. We use it for whatever valve we're using. So just to spend a minute or two on the reasons for not deploying a sentinel device, um, uh, obviously if you can't advance the device, despite the tricks we talked about, the getting the patient to take a deep breath uh, and uh, uh, bad radial spasm, although I have to say radial spasm is very unusual with this device, actually much less so than with radial PCI, in my experience anyway. Um, the reasons we didn't attempt CPD at all uh, was either because the patient was screened out due to unfavorable anatomy. Um, I think what we would view as unfavorable in June last year is not the same as what we view as unfavorable this year, and we're much more willing to try the device now. Um, we used to feel that aortic regurgitation, if there's no calcium on the valve, uh, they don't need cerebral protection. I think, as uh, Nicholas's circulation paper shows, it's not just the valve, it's, uh, it's the aortic arch, it's uh, thrombus from the myocardium, bits of myocardium, all of those things are relevant, and therefore we would use the sentinel cerebral protection device, even when it's pure AI, even if there isn't substantial valvular calcium. Um, so the, here are some of the considerations that we have when we're planning uh, a procedure using cerebral protection. Um, most of the, ta the TAVI population has a lot of uh, vascular calcium. Vascular calcium in itself is not an issue. What matters is vascular calcium causing stenosis. They don't use. Um, severe tortuosity, uh, for the most part, you can get past it with the device. It's very uh, flexible and easy to deliver. Um, and uh, we generally wouldn't exclude a patient on the basis of tortuosity from the CT, because you never quite know until you get there, and in most patients you can deliver the device. Uh, it's quite uncommon to have uh, a stenosis at the origin of the left common carotid or at the uh, origin of the brachiocephalic trunk, but if you do and the vessel size is too small, the number we use is six millimeters, uh, then we would uh, not use uh, cerebral protection. Uh, since using this device, I've learned a lot more about aortic arch anatomy. There's quite a lot of variability between different individuals. Most patients have a type 1 arch, that is the left common carotid is a branch of the aortic arch itself. Uh, 10 or 15% have a bovine aortic arch, a type 2 arch, that is where the left common carotid is a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk. Now, in the early days, we would exclude these patients from uh, using the Sentinel device uh, because it's quite difficult if you're trying to steer the wire in into the left common carotid with the device itself. It's quite difficult to get the right angle. What we do now is uh, we have a slightly different technique. So we use a long wire, same kind of wire, so a, a balanced heavyweight or a choice PT. We use an exchange length wire on a, a JR4 four French catheter. We advance the four French catheter into the ascending aorta withdraw the wire, pull the catheter back until it engages with the ostium of the left common carotid, then advance the coronary wire into the left common carotid, remove the JR4 catheter, and then you could advance the sentinel device over that wire. Mm -hmm. So most bovine anatomy, you can now de deliver the sentinel device, and, and that's what we do. 
To give you an idea of our learning curve, um, in the last 200 patients we've used this device on, we used it in 100, or we attempted it in 178 patients, and we had successful deployment in 166, so that's a 93% device success rate. Um, to give you some of the details of the procedure, echoing what's been previously shown, there is no significant difference in the fluoroscopy time, the radiation dose, or the contrast volume. Um, this, the graph on the left shows the absolute difference in stroke rate in the sentinel patients versus the no sentinel patients. Five patients, that's 1.1% of patients who received the sentinel device developed a stroke. Yeah, yeah. That's compared with eight patients or 4.9% in the group who did not. That equates to a 3.8% absolute risk reduction and a 78% relative risk reduction, giving us a number needed to treat to prevent one stroke of 26. Uh, to put that into context with the rest of the data, the Sentinel trial, the Ulm study, uh, the Erasmus data, and ours, the relative risk reduction is similar in all of those four uh, different cohorts of patients. So I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective. I've trained in the UK National Health Service, and now I work in a big academic medical center in the US. Um, but, and, and while access to medical devices there is easier than it is here, um, the cost of an individual procedure, particularly the fist, fixed cost, is under a great deal of scrutiny. Uh, but those discussions generally fail to take into account the cost of a stroke. Um, in our experience, the number needed to treat to prevent one stroke at seven days is 26. The cost of the Sentinel device in our institution is $2,800, and the cost of present, preventing a stroke is therefore $72,800. Stroke, I think we all agree, is a devastating complication. The stroke rate, everything else in TAVR is getting better. The stroke rate persists at 4 or 5%. Um, the enormous physical, emotional, and financial cost of stroke has already been discussed. And I think we also need to think that as the indications for TAVI expand, as we start to do TAVI on younger patients, where there's obviously an increased prevalence of um, bicuspid valves, uh, the stakes are even higher, even higher than they are now. The Cedars-Sinai experience is that, is that the Sentinel cerebral protection device is, is quick, it's easy, and it's safe. Uh, it's now part of our routine TAVI practice. We've noticed no significant difference in procedure time, x-ray exposure, or contrast use, and stroke rates were significantly reduced with the use of this device. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. It's good to have you in the group of the believers. Um, do you also uh, have used uh, embolic protection in other indications than TAVI? So for instance, for left atrial appendage, mitral interventions? Yeah, so there's uh, published data now on using um, the Sentinel device in, in those other indications and other cerebral protection devices in those other indications. I have to say that we do not, no. We don't use it in left atrial appendage or mitral clip is the other one that's, been, that's being discussed a lot now, but we don't, we have no and, and for instance, um, a sapien in Mac, for instance, would that make sense? Uh, it would make sense. Um, uh, I mean, sapien in Mac is a is a somewhat stressful procedure at the best of times. Um, so I think to have the added protection of uh, cerebral protection is is definitely worth considering. Yeah, I can I can attest to that. We did two cases of um, valve and Mac, and in both cases there was really chunks of calcium, more than 1.5 millimeter in yeah. in size, that we captured in the filters. Same so, experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are running slightly out of time, so maybe one quick question, Dan? Well, I'm not sure it's going to be quick. I was just <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I mean, we've, we, we're all believers in this technology for good reason, and I think, you know, if we all ask ourselves the question, if one of our family members was having a tabby, would, would they want, we want them to have cerebral protection? It's a no-brainer, no pun intended. But, you know, for the people in the audience, I guess, we are sitting in a slightly difficult situation we're not quite sure the evidence you know, from many healthcare environments cr uh, crosses the threshold for routine use. We, it's difficult to predict which patients are going to have a stroke. Where can, where, where, where can the people in the audience who are thinking about introducing this technology go? Do we need to try and get a definitive clinical endpoint trial? Um, can they introduce in selective patients? Didier, what's your perspective on that? I do believe that uh, one of the first, uh, the main obstacle to the adoption of the, uh, this technology, it's a superb technology, we, we can clearly see that. You've seen that yesterday during the live transmission from Sam Thomas, is there is most of the time, if it's not 100% of the time of the cases, debris within the filters, and it's sometimes microscopic debris, so it's mainly an economical issue. 
So if we, a, a first step could be to try to identify what is a high risk patient for stroke. And you said uh, previously in your lecture that a patient with a previous history of stroke is at high risk of uh, recurrence of stroke. So maybe this is the first uh, subgroup of patients that we uh, uh, should treat. Uh, I have the also, we have also have had information from the uh, uh, TVT registry, S3 in bike speed, higher risk of stroke, so it could be a second identified uh, subgroup of patients that could benefit from uh, the claret. And step by step, we're going to understand that, that at the end of the day, every single patient undergoing a transcatheter procedure should be protected. And that's, this is our uh, uh, believe, but we need to provide information and to uh, gather all the data that we have. And I have to say that I, I have been impressed. I have been impressed because I've learned something today, and it's quite consistent through the uh, data from Cedar Sinai and Rotterdam. There is a consistent 4% reduction in the occurrence of stroke if you protect the brain of your patient. And this is true. This is uh, uh, real life daily practice and I think to my opinion this is one of the most important arguments to promote the use of cerebral protection device for every single patient but maybe start by identifying the high-risk patients and then in, uh, I, I do believe that in the future it will be routine for every single patient. So uh, I'm quite afraid we don't have time anymore for uh, the, the discussion, but I uh, really much enjoyed it. It was extremely interesting, extremely dense. We had a lot of information that we need to digest, but the message is that certainly uh, cerebral protection is here to stay. It has a real benefit for our patient, but we need to work all together as a community to better understand who is going to benefit at the start before the large expansion. So thank, I'd like to thank all the speakers. You've done a tremendous job. My co-chairman, Nicolas, and for sure Boston for this nice symposium. Thank you. Bye -bye.